A uh, couple quick stories about our next, uh, our next presenter, our keynote speaker. Um, first is that uh, back in the summer when our committee got together and uh, was putting together the 2013 uh, list of, of speakers, um, Chuck's name came up right away. We had two fantastic speakers last year, homegrown talent in Hank Haney and Randy Smith, and, uh, and Chuck's name came up right away as, the, as the, you know, the top one that we were hopeful, fingers crossed, that we could get him to come and speak to our section. And, uh, and we're ecstatic that we got such a quick response from, uh, from Chuck and that he was willing to come in, uh, and speak to us. So first, uh, a big thank you to that, Chuck. Secondly, about, I'm going to say, probably two months ago in Golf Week, I read a fantastic article uh, about Chuck Cook and Ben Hogan. And Chuck had went to visit, went and visited Ben Hogan when he was a young, aspiring teaching professional. And the story recounts the two days that he spent with, uh, with Ben Hogan. Hopefully you can give us maybe just a couple minutes on that because that was a, a riveting article. And I, I still use some of the information from that article today in, uh, in stories that I tell as I'm, as I'm teaching. Um, this gentleman has um, multiple U.S. Open titles under his belt as an instructor, and uh, recently uh, our PGA champion in 2013, Jason Duffner, who put on a clinic at, uh, at Oak Hill uh, Country Club. Chuck's the founder of Chuck Cook Golf Academy. He spends his time uh, split between uh, UT Golf Club and Dallas National, and uh, we are more than privileged, Chuck, to have you here today to, uh, to share your wealth and knowledge. Ladies and gentlemen, Chuck Cook. Thank you, Tim. You, you oh, yeah, I got it. Okay. Well, I have to ask Tim, have you got a chance to ride in the Mercedes yet? You got, huh? Yeah. You have? Yeah. yeah, those of you guys know that uh, his boss, Paul Ernest, got closest to the pin and won that Mercedes. You got to ride in it, though, huh? Is it red? It's red. That fits his personality perfectly. <laughs> then. Um, well, I can't tell you what an honor it is to be here. Uh, this section has so many great teaching professionals, uh, uh, world class, that have, have come out of here, that I, uh, a lot of whom I've learned uh, a lot of my stuff uh, from these guys, from Randy Smith and, and from Hank and uh, talking with Chris Cuomo, uh, also from this section. Uh, just a phenomenal, talented group of, of people. It's a hotbed of golf instruction, and I know you guys share a lot, and so... For me to be invited to be here, it's really an honor, and I want to thank you a lot for that. And um, Cameron was talking about being nervous, and I'm nervous too. We're always nervous when we get up to present, but uh, I want to tell you a story about really being nervous. There's a guy, Hal Underwood, a lot of, maybe some of you older professionals might have known Hal. Well, Hal qualified, made it to the tour. Uh, but he couldn't get in any tournaments early on, and so the first tournament that he got into, he got in as an alternate, and it was at Westchester. And as an alternate, because somebody dropped out, he got paired with Arnold Palmer and Butch Baird. Okay? So those of you that knew Butch Baird, Butch had a terrible stutter. I mean, he had a hard time saying anything, and he'd tell a lot of stories about him, say, he's Brian, he's dead. But uh, so here's Hank, and he's the first one to hit in this par three hole, that first hole at Westchester, I don't know if you remember, and he said, I got down, I got ready to, trying to tee my ball up, and my hands were shaking so bad I couldn't get the ball on the tee and get the tee in the ground. He said, back then we all smoked, had these Munsingwear shirts, had a pack of cigarettes, and cigarettes fell out of the pocket, and the cigarettes came out of the pack, and I'm trying to get the cigarettes back in the pack, and the pack back in the pocket, and the ball on the tee, and this, that, and the other, and he says, I look around, and the crowd has gone dead silent. And Butch is trying to tell him to calm down, so he looks over at Butch, and Butch is over there going. <laughs> and Hal says, God Almighty, I'm choking so bad I've gone deaf. <laughs> <laughs> so now that's nervous. Now that's really nervous when you go deaf over that. All right, I'll tell you a little, uh, before I start my presentation, I'll tell you some of the, about the two days of Ben Hogan, uh, I taught, started the Academy of Golf down at Lakeway, and it was a Jack Nicholas facility, and so 
we invited Phil Rogers, who was Jack's teacher at the time, uh, to come down and, and teach with us. And uh, so we ran golf schools down there, and Phil was good friends with a lady who was a member at Shady Oaks named Susie, uh, Susie Stanley, I think was her name. And she was great friends with Hogan. And she'd have lunch with him and talk with him like that. So I asked Phil, I said, well, you ask Susie if she could range it where I could go up and watch Hogan practice. And so he talked to her. She talked to him. He agreed, not uh, happily, I don't think, but he agreed. And I went up there for two days. Uh, and so I went up. After lunch, he would go out and hit balls. And so I went out with him. And we didn't say a word. He didn't say a word, and I didn't say a word after the introductions. And uh, he started hitting balls. And Phil Rogers and I were teaching together back then. We were teaching in and shut, and up and across the line, drop it inside, and flip your wrist through impact like this. Okay, So we thought that was right, obviously. We wouldn't have been teaching it. Our students could really hit it off a high tee with a seven iron. Man, they could hit these high draws out there. We thought we were something. And uh, so Hogan goes out, and the first shot, he sort of lags it back, and then he fanned, fanned it open, laid it off like this. And any time I'd ever seen anybody in that position, they shanked it. So I'm, I'm standing caddy view, and he comes kind of like this, and I sort of <laughs> go like this, like, oh, he's going to hit me. And he, you know, I don't even see the first couple of shots because it looks like every one of them going to be a shank. So then I watched a little closer, and he, same thing, and he, when he came down, it looked like he was going to hit the ball with the sole of the club. He was hitting the ball with the sole of the club is what it looked like. That was the impression that you got, was that he came in and hit it like, like that. And so I'm watching high right, you know, to see all these balls go out there, and they're just coming out there just dead flat, screaming at the target, just going dead straight. And his ball flight was different. Uh, than anybody I'd ever seen, really before or since. I had never seen anybody like this. What would happen is, as he'd come down, as he came down, he would bow his wrist. Okay, he talked about that, about arching his wrist. Bow his wrist like this and trap the ball. And when you get the wrist bowed like this, it's actually a block. It's a low right position. You know, people say that's closed, except at impact, that's low and right. Okay, unless you roll your hands over. All right, so this thing is club face is looking low right, and the only way he could get it on line was to swing his hands way to the left real early. That was the only way that he could get that club to face the target, club face to face the target when he came in on the ball. And so he trapped the heck out of the thing. It wasn't a big divot or anything like a real shallow divot. But it came out, and the ball would go real flat, not low necessarily, but real flat, and it would take a long time to hit the ground, so it would go like that. It just go out and it just look like it just took forever spinning all the way down on the ground like that. And then when he hit drivers, he would hit them and they looked. And I played with Tiger and Nicholas and they both sort of hit it go sort of high launch and just topple over like that, go like this, you know. And his would come out of there and it'd go screaming out of there like that. And then it looked like it'd pick up a turbo boost. It'd go like that, you know. And I'd go, damn, I've never seen that, you know, before. And uh, so I asked Bob Bell or uh, Bob Bush one time. He's he a true temper shaft guy from old guy, like the rest of us. And so I said, "What's happened that he's, when he does that to the ball?" And he says, "What happens is when you smash a ball, it distorts, which we all know. One side gets flat, and the other side bounces out. And then it comes back, and the other side distorts, and it goes back and forth like this un until it gets round, and then it takes the spin." And said, so "What happened with Hogan? He just never hit any curves, so he just..." compressed it straight and it'd go whew. and that first part you'd see is where the ball was distorted and then when it get round it'd just take off again. And I played with Bubba Watson one time at his club in Phoenix when he was at Estancia. And I saw that effect and this was the reason he hit the wedge too. We were playing the second hole was a, in fact it was funny, the pro there, Terry Carlson, was a friend of mine, we were going to go play and Bubba asked if he could join us. We said, sure. We were introduced, you know. So he, at this time, Bubba hadn't won anything, hadn't won any tournaments. And so he goes, he goes, uh, so you're a teaching pro, huh? I go, yep. He says, well, I don't have a pro. I said, you ain't got any wins either. 
<laughs> so, <clears throat> so every time he'd make a birdie, he'd go, no, teacher. Every time he'd make a bogey, I'd go, no, wins. So we had, we had a good time. But anyway, the second hole is about a 400-yard dog leg left, par four. And I said, you just take it at the green, don't you? He says, yeah, most of the time, but watch this. So he goes out and he hits this drive and he hits it right down the middle of the fairway. Looks like it's going to go 150 yards in the desert. And it gets out there and then it, it's going like this and then it takes a spin that had slice spin, just looked like a scud missile going like that, rolled up just short of the green, like that with this big slice. And so it's the same effect that he had. You know, he just compresses it so hard that the ball won't take a spin until later. And, uh, you know, the harder you hit it, the later it takes the spin. And, uh, and consequently, the more spin you have because the ball is on there longer. Same thing with Hogan. So anyway, after I watched, after I started watching him, Hogan, after I started watching him, I started counting how many steps the caddy had to go to pick up the ball. And in two days, and this is all clubs. I mean, he used one odd clubs one day, at even clubs the other, I think. Uh, but the most steps Caddy had to go to pick up any ball was eight. This is with drivers, two irons, three woods. The most steps Caddy had, he missed his target 24 feet. That was his worst miss in two days with all clubs. And only one time did Caddy have to go backwards. And so he asked me after he, after, uh, he got finished the first day, he says, well, boy, what do you think? I said, well, Mr. Hogan, I said, you know, they told me you had a weak grip, but your grip doesn't look weak to me. Cause you know, well, I wasn't sure because he set his hands back, you know, sort of set his hands behind the ball so his wrist was like this. And I couldn't tell whether the grip was strong or just, you know, because his hands were back. And he said, well, after I built the apex shaft, I didn't need a weak grip. And so what he meant was is he had the other shaft would kick in no matter what Art says, that shaft would kick in and close the face, and he had to use a weak grip to try and keep the face open back then. But as he got stronger shafts, he could play with a stronger grip. And then the second question I asked him that day was, uh, or the second comment I made was, I said, they told me that you hit a fade, but it looks to me like you hit the ball straight. He goes, it's a fade. <laughs> well, all right then. <laughs> so, <laughs> I wasn't going to argue with him. But the next day, he was a lot nicer. He asked me to lunch, and I didn't go. I said, I didn't want to I didn't want to take a chance on overstepping my bounds, but I, I said, I would like to watch again. So I went out and watched him, and, and uh, he talked a little bit more. I asked him, some, one of the questions I asked him, I said, was your best golf in 1953 when you won those, those three turns? He said, oh, no, no, no. He said, my best golf was uh, before the accident. He said, I hit the ball a lot further than the than I did after the accident. He said, I just hit it so much farther. He said, a lot of people don't know, but 1941, when he won his first tournament, it was at uh, Pinehurst, when he won the North-South, he also won the next two. So he won, when he won his first, he won three in a row. And he said, in that, in that stretch, he said, that's 216 holes, I hit 214 greens. He only missed two greens in three tournaments. I mean, the guy had control of his ball you know, better than anybody before or since. So I've always tried to remember, you know, what, I know what it looks like when it's good, what it's supposed to look like, you know, and that's been a big help for me, I think, just because of, uh, because of that. And of course, the equipment's different, the ball's different, and things like that, but you can still tell, and we can still, we're good, track man's proven out a lot of stuff. One of the things Claude Harmon told me is he, he, when Claude was the pro at uh, uh, Seminole, he said Hogan would come down and practice for the Masters. That's where he'd go down and practice. And he said back then, Claude Harm told me it was 1981 or so, he told me, he says, yeah, he says, Hogan believed every ball should go the same height. So he, would, he had a tree that he thought was the right height. So he'd go back and hit a nine iron, make it peak at the tree, go back 10 yards, make his eight iron peak at the top of that tree, go back, make a seven iron peak at the top of that tree, and so forth. And the track man's proven that out, that everybody hits every club same height within a, within a couple of yards. Uh, the lowest club is the pitching wedge.
but, but you know, all the other clubs, including drivers, and three, three woods and nine irons and everything, all go the same height. So the guy was a genius. You know, I mean, he was he was a special special type of guy. Um, <clears throat> all right, what do I do? Okay, so this is my presentation. What I teach and why, and this is the first. First time I've ever done this type of presentation. I've always believed that, and I still am, what's called a match-up teacher. In other words, I'll try and match up fundamentals to fit together rather than teach a method. But I think all teachers have a model in their mind. And I've never really talked about my model and what I believe. And so I've never seen anybody swing to my model. So. You know, I don't know if it's, I don't know, I don't know if it works or not, but uh, I have some strong feelings about the way things should work. And so that's, that's why I decided to do it. I'm getting pretty old. I mean, I have too many more chances to, you know, to talk about these things. So I wanted to get my preferences on record, I guess. So what I teach and why. Um, this is part of being old school. I'm old school, but I've, uh, I'm an old guy, but I'm a new school guy in that. Um, I was the first guy to ever use launch monitor to teach. Uh, used the old Achiever way back when. We didn't have it. We had no modeling. We didn't know what the numbers were supposed to be. We just had to figure it out ourselves for a while. Uh, 1980, we I had a golf academy that had a biomechanical engineer on there, Ralph Mann. Uh, we had a fitness guy, Alvar Meal, who was the strength coach for the 49ers and the Chicago Bulls. Uh, we had Dick Coop was our psychologist, sports psychologist, and we had Dave Pels doing short game. And so this was, like I said, back in 1980, we were, uh, had a very holistic approach to golf, and it's been gratifying to me as I've gotten older to see how things have grown in all of these different areas. Obviously, golf fitness has, has bloomed, the psych psychology part of it's bloomed, uh, the biomechanical stuff that's, that Ralph uh, basically pioneered in golf has gotten bigger and better um, and so uh, I'm, I'm I am a new school guy uh, TPI certified level 2 golf pro K vest level 2 certified Nike 360 golf, 360 uh, fitness golf professional first one ever uh, in that deal so I stay up with the state of my art is what I try and do. But because I've been around a long time, when we grew up, when we started teaching, basically what we did is we taught the club as teachers. In other words, we made the club do what it had to do to make the ball do uh, what we wanted it to do. And we didn't care what the body did to accommodate that. So if a guy's overturned his hips and lifted his heel off the ground and had too much turn. We got the club over here where a guy could hit the ball from the inside. That's, that was fine with us. We didn't really care because that would make the club do what we wanted to do to hit the shot that we were trying to hit. Um, and there have been, there probably, if you take all of the uh, measurements for efficiency, you probably see even the top touring professionals at the most are probably about 75% efficient with what they do, with what we know is to be efficient body movement, okay? But they, a lot of them play really good golf, which means they're proficient. In other words, uh, I, use, I throw Jimmy up there, obviously, because his swing is one of the most recognizables from being a long way from orthodoxy. Uh, but... He's a very proficient golfer with 18 tour wins, the major championship, the players championship, uh, Ryder Cup, many Ryder Cup players. I still believe that. I still believe that the club has to, the club has to, uh, is what's telling the story to the ball to make it do what you want it to do. And I still teach that way first. And then as it goes along, I try to make that swing that's proficient, more efficient. Obviously the best, in all worlds to be proficiently efficient or efficiently proficient, something like that. Um, but again, that's a priority of mine. Next thing is, when it comes to teaching, I have 
go golfing machine guy, doctor in the golfing machine uh, for a long time. And the golfing machine is misunderstood a lot. People think of it as a method, it's not a method at all. The golfing machine is basically a book that has all these different options of ways to play golf and explains them very well. Uh, it's, uh, and the, the, what we have here, there are three imperatives that I don't think probably any of you would disagree with. And these are the, this is really what the golfing machine teaches. Okay, so it, it teaches the, th the three things that are imperative, and this is what I try to teach in all the lessons I give to anybody, I'm working on one of these three things, period. This is what I teach, okay? So impact, so talking about a good impact, I call it a flat lead wrist at impact, uh, is part of, part of the impact position. Um, the second thing, if you, if you have a flat lead wrist at impact, you have the longest arc you can have from the shoulder all the way down, it's a straight line. You have club face control, you're gonna compress the ball like that. Uh, secondly, so you're going to hit the ball solidly if you have that. Secondly, if you do that on plane, where you're going to hit the ball straight. And if you do it with lag, which I'm, I'll talk about all these in greater detail, and if you do it with lag, you'll hit it long. So you've got your lag to hit it long, you've got your plane to hit it straight, and you've got your impact position to hit it solid and compress the ball. Okay, so to talk about these a little farther, uh, James Lights, who's a track man guy, this guy's a really interesting guy. How many of you know of James? Yeah, a lot of you guys know James. James, well known for his work with track man, but also he works with the AMM system, uh, 3D system, uh, like the one that they use at TPI, and he's a brilliant scientist guy, I love studying this stuff, taking, the, taking statistics and everything like that. And so we were talking about that flat wrist and he said, you know, he said, I have done all the tour pros, but all the tour pros I've ever measured with AMM, none of them have a flat wrist. And he says, they all have a bowed wrist. And he said, so 100% of the touring professionals that he's measured 3D, their wrist is bowed, okay? So, like Hogan. Uh, to a certain degree. And so again, like I say, it gives you full radius. It makes you a straight line from the shoulder to the ball. It gives you club face control. It gives you compression. And I think it's important to know what moves the hands forward is the rotation of the body. This is what moves the hands from the center of the body up to the front leg at impact like that. And that's important to know because if you think about, you know, we talked about uh, shoulder squared impact, Art mentioned that. Uh, Sean Foley and I have talked about this a lot, but think of any sport that you can where you're facing this way and hitting this way. Okay, imagine a baseball batter that when he came into the ball, he's looking at home plate trying to hit the ball to center field. That's what he'd look like, isn't it? Or a tennis player, okay, who waits till the ball gets right here in front of him and then tries to hit it over the net, or a hockey player. There's no, no sport, really, that you do that. And so all of them, if you're a baseball batter, they're open, they're rotated, and they catch the ball out in front of them. The tennis players, they come in, they keep the back of this wrist bent, their body opens up, and they catch the ball out in front of them. That's the golf position. If you look at a hockey player, as they come in, they're twisted on their skates like that. And so they all, all other sports have that. Same thing in golf. You want to be rotated. If you look at the 3D stuff, average is about 35 to 40 degrees open with the hips and 25 to 30 degrees open with the shoulders. Now we're going to talk about that a little bit more. The appearances, because the shoulders are so vertical at impact that they look more square than they really are. But if you look at those things, that's what you'll see. And that rotation is what moves the hands up to that position. That's what I like to see anyway. All right, here's a picture of Tom Kite in 1992. I'm going to have pictures up here from Old Hogan to Tiger at Muirfield last year, Hunter Mahan, Justin Rose. You're going to see that all of this stuff is, goes throughout the, the whole era of time 
uh, in golf. And so this is Tom when he was probably the best ball striker on tour at the time. And he won 11 tournaments in a two-year period all over the world uh, during this time, 91, 92. Um, but again, you can see where his wrist is there at impact. It's just a good impact picture. All right, playing. Okay, so how do we... We talk about playing, and Hank Haney is the one that made everybody aware of swing plane. Okay, now Hank's old swing plane wasn't all that hot, but when he had, I remember he used to say, he'd go back, he'd say, you can't get the club head too far below your hands coming into the ball. These are old, old, old days, you know. And then, of course, later on it was, you know, it was tipping this way. But what's, what happens with all of, of, of people that have somewhat of a method is that what they do is they present some part of golf fundamentals, and then there, everybody else studies it, okay? Square to square, that was flat left wrist that Jim Flick had. Jimmy Ballard with connection, okay? So it made everybody look at connection and how the right side fired through the ball. Okay, now they found that, okay, yeah, you want to fire through the ball, but you want to be, you want to fire on plane, not over plane when you fire through. So thank Annie, okay, so what is the plane? Okay, where, where is the plane? Where, where should we swing this club? Uh, the same thing about, you know, with the, with the flat left wrist with, with that. So what I use for the plane, what I found is, the only factor that really matters, okay, uh, in measurements with this, is that the is the lie angle of the club. So if I took the lie angle of the club minus the droop of the shaft that you have dynamically, where the shaft bends down this way, so let's say this is 60 degree lie, you'd probably have three or four degrees of droop. So I would use I would want that club to be coming into that ball on a 57 degree swing plane, somewhere around that. And everybody that plays the tour does that, no matter where they're coming from, okay? So they may be coming from Jim Furyk's, they're gonna come down on that, because they want the club sold at impact. They don't want the club with the toe Lower in the heel, the heel lower in the toe. They want the club sold at impact. Everybody comes down that line, 100% of them. With, I shouldn't say right on, within an inch and a half of that line. Okay, so to me, that's the plane that matters. And on the downswing only. I mean, you have guys that you'll have like Matt Kuchar will sometimes get underneath it, and then he'll lift it up to that plane. But everybody comes down on that plane. So what I've... So that's what I use. I say, okay, that's what I want. And my feeling is, is that, it, and then that plane wants to be straight, okay? So you see guys coming down, where that plane, if you, if you can imagine it as a hula hoop, okay, that goes around my body, okay, just to, to have it. So I want that hula hoop to be straight, okay? So it's around my body, so that means it's on both sides. So for me to swing straight, I've got to come down the plane here and then come back up the plane over here. I can't come down the plane here and then go down the line. That's crooked. It won't go straight. The ball won't go straight. I've got to manipulate the club face to get it to go straight. I've got to have the straight plane line. I want the club on the plane here. I want the club on the plane there. I want it swinging on that plane line. You could have it there like Jack Nicklaus was a little above that had real upright golf clubs, a little above and a little above, but it was straight. Sergio, a little under and a little under, but it's straight. Okay? So that's a big part of that. And then only on the downswing does it really matter, the angle at which you come into the ball. It doesn't really matter if you take it back on that on the backswing or not. As a preference, I might like that, but it's not a requirement, but the downswing becomes a requirement. So this is a picture of Duff, uh, and this is the lying of that club, and that's where he is at the top of his backswing. So he's pretty close to that. I see, I'm seeing more guys get closer to that 
then guys are getting away from that. And the guys that are more pretty upright, that have beautiful golf swings, if you took Charles Schwartzel, Adam Scott, uh, Rory McIlroy, uh, Louis Eustazen, probably the four guys are the best looking golf swings out there, I would, I would think. But they all have to find that plane and they all have a tendency as they're dropping that club to the plane for the, the momentum of the swing to go under. Like McElroy, when he gets that club dropping underneath, he can't hit that Nike driver. There's no spin on it. So it won't come back. It'll just stay out to right field. Uh, Oostazen, same thing. He gets that thing dropped. Charles Schwartzel, same thing. That's what they get. They fight that because of the momentum of going from higher to being on it. Now, they've all gotten lower and lower and lower as time has gone along with Adam Scott. So they're all closer to being like him, uh, but none of them are quite, quite as low as he is. But that's a, it's pretty easy to play from there. Uh, lag, like we said, is a power producer. And it's compatible with swinging on plane. For instance, if I, if I have throwaway, I don't want to swing on plane, I'll hit it fat. So if I have throwaway with a club, I want to swing over the top because then I can bottom out where the ball is, okay? But lag, this is where I think it's misunderstood. Lag is the whole swing from the ground up. Every part is lagging behind the other part. And as soon as you break that chain, you lose your power and you lose your control. And so when you're coming into the ball, the ankle is behind the foot, okay? And then the knee is behind the ankle. And then the hip is behind the knee. And then the shoulder is behind the hip. And then the hands are behind the shoulder. And the club head is behind the hands. So it's not just, this is lag. That's not lag, that's a downcock. Lag is the whole system. Of, it means one, each part is lagging behind the other part. And there's, I don't think there's very many of you that disagree with that. You'd want that sequence from the ground up. We found all that out through 3D and a lot of biomechanical measurements. That's the way the swing works, is that each part follows the other part. And that's how you get a transfer of energy to become efficient. Okay, so lag, if you see this, there's a, something stopping somewhere. Okay? And then use it, don't lose it. I see so many guys go, ah, bud, you're too narrow. I want you to really get wider on the downswing. Well, you don't want to lose it. Want to get wider? Okay, now you're wider. <laughs> All right? Now I can come in more shallow and more behind it. All right? Okay, don't lose it. It's like a, this, will, this will give you a good picture. So here's your, as you're coming down, all right? Right here is the boat. Right here is the water skier, all right? So as you're coming into that swing, you want this guy to be going as fast as you can at impact. What would you do with your boat? Huh? Yeah, you'd, you'd, you'd quit going forward and do what? Go around in a circle like this, right? You wouldn't, what would happen if you just stopped the boat? <laughs> God sink. You want to fling him off the end of those skis, you just take, you get that, that handle going around that corner as tight as you can, and that head of that club whips through that ball like crazy. That's how you do it. That's how you get that speed. A little short pulley. And the handle is the handle's moving up and in at impact, so it's coming this way at impact when it hits that ball. And that's what gets the head going down and out. Like that, see? It's a it's a real it's a real important it's one of the reasons I think some of my guys do pretty well is because they they try to do that. They don't try to flip the club head to catch it up, they try and drag the club, keep the lag in the in the swing, but just do it up the plane as opposed to doing it down the line. Imagine that. Is this boat pulling that water skier going to go faster than 
This one? No way. Can't be done. Keegan Bradley, that'd be lagging. You can see everything there from the ground up. That right elbow is about to hit his belly button. Okay, so that's what I'm trying to get. Good impact on plane, straight plane line with lag. All right? So how do I want the club to do to move to do that? Okay, so the club head, club shaft, and the club face, we'll talk about each of those. So um, what happens is the club head gets behind the hands and stays there. So as you're coming in the impact, club's always behind the hands. I always, always want it behind the hands. And so it just stays there. And I, what I like to see is I like to see you continue to lag the club, but just lag it up the plane. In other words, so as, you're, as this, this handle's going around the corner like that, it, the club head still stays behind the hands even on this side of the ball. So I don't like that. I think it's I do think it's a speed producer. I think that there is some there is some speed uh, produced there, but I think at high level golf, I think you can get a lot of speed this way. Obviously, a lot of guys do, and maintain the control of the club face, and you can trap the ball. You can hit it like Hogan doing that. That's the way Hogan did it. He had the wrist bowed, club was way behind his hand, and then he. Got that handle going around the corner. I got some pictures of Hogan over here with the fairway wood where the butt of the club's an inch away from his body. That's how tight the circle he made with the club like that. Um, and I think that the, your hands are always in the same position at an impact. It's just with an iron, the ball's back there, and with the driver, the ball's, the ball's up there. So I don't try to change my swing. It just you you'll have a you'll have a different contact point just because of the ball position there with between drivers and the balls on the ground, and then two ways to zero out the shaft. What I mean by zero out is like with the driver where you're trying to get the shaft more straight up and down. Okay, you have two ways of doing it. One is by this, and one is by this, and that's the method I prefer is that the body just continues to rotate the club on around the corner like that. Okay? If you got any questions, just stick your hand up. All right, so this is Duff. This is when we first started working, really, 2008. You can see how close the club face is and how much higher his hands are a little bit, but he always moved the club head well. And so you can see the club head's cocked, stays cocked. Coming down here, it's cocked in front of his body, hands up by his front leg, shafts leaning forward, catches his hands out there, uh, and then finish. And what happens is this, is, this is important to know, I think. There's a place in the golf swing where everything comes to a culmination of forces, okay? And that place is where both arms are straight, okay? So from the top of the swing, as you go down, the hips go first, the shoulders are following, okay, so the hips get to square, the shoulders are still turned, and the hips are, they're not accelerating the same, they're decelerating, but they're still turning, and the shoulders catch the hips right when both arms get straight, and as the hips are turning, that left leg gets straight at the same time, so all of that happens where both arms are straight. And that's this picture right here. That's where you're, that's where you see if you can, when you measure that spot, TPI, learn that TPI. Is that that's the culmination of all the, that's where the shoulders finally catch the hips, where the left leg posts up, and where the right arm gets straight. It's all right in that spot. All right, the shaft. So, what I like to see is the shaft just stay pretty close to that plane line, not get too far away. If you can, create some power, and I think it's pretty good. And I brought this up. I try to use my students because I know, I know the angles are pretty good. It's Corey Pavin after we had worked. This is 1996. I think, actually, I think it's in Houston. And so, and I use him. 
So you can see the head of the club is not dead on that shaft, but it's pretty close. And then you can see how even though this is above it, at least it's pretty close to pointing at the ball, which is what I would like. And then this one, I noticed that I didn't have it. I had it on my mind where he was coming down. He was right on that line coming into the ball. I'll show you another picture. And of course, he's along it here. And then after impact, you can see how the club is staying on that plane. Okay, so that's swinging the shaft on a straight plane line. Um, this is a picture of Duff. Same thing. So you can see here the head of the club's out on the plane line. At the top, his hands are pretty close to being on plane. Down here, all he has to do from where he is at the top is just rotate. And then you can see after impact, that club's pretty close to staying on the plane. And so, you know, my feeling is, is that the easy way to play golf is, is if you're on plane, if your wrist is flat, that's your impact position. If you're on plane, your arms are in front of your body like this, all you have to do is rotate. And so from right there, the right side of your body just rotates into the ball like that, all the way through into all the way through this release interval over here like this until it catches up. Yes. What's your preferred shot, uh, shot shape? Do you have one? Medium high straight ball. For my, for my model, okay? Off of that, you'd build all sorts of different things. So one of the phrases that I used, uh, uh, this is one of the things I passed on to uh, Sean Foley. Uh, I've helped him out a little bit. He started working with Tiger, and I, I saw what he was doing, and so I, I called him. I said, I said, you're messing up our national treasure. You don't have that right. Let me explain a few things to you. And to his credit, he's a great guy. I mean, he's he he smart, smart, smart guy. And I said, you got the tiger got four steeps going on and no shallows. I said, he can, no way he'll ever hit the ball the right distance unless it gets lucky or bounces off a tree or something. But I said, he said, I said he's he's in front of the ball. He's closer to the ground. That drives his hands more forward. He's got massive lag of the club head, and he's swinging left. I said, he's got four steeps and no shallows. And I said, you need to get him more behind the ball and taller is what you need, you need to do. Keep the, let him swing left, because I know he doesn't like the hook, and then uh, keep the lag, because I know he doesn't like to hit it short. And, uh, but we were, Anyway, it was funny when we were talking about that, but one of the things I explained to him is that f from right in here, okay, the golf pride is on top of this grip, okay, right here. My wrist is flat or bowed, all right? And so what you want to do is you want to keep the golf pride on top as you go around the corner. And the club face has a very gradual closing like that. In other words, there's no flash closing through there like that. And then secondly, if this wrist maintains its angle, if it stays flat, then you maintain the loft of the club. You always have the same loft. So as you're coming in like this, then I know what the loft I'm going to have on that golf club because that wrist is a constant, and that, de that determines how much loft I have. So if I have that face Closing gradually, I know I'm not going to hit anything but pushes or pulls or straight balls. I'm not going to hit curve balls. And if I keep that wrist at the same angle as I go through there, I know that I'm going to have the same loft on the club all the time. And with those two things, I can control the distance of the shot, the, uh, uh, the distance and the direction of the shot. And with Tiger, he was so far forward, so far down, he had like 17, 18 degrees lean in the shaft with a six iron. The only way he could get the ball in the air was to take his wrist and lay the face back through impact like this. So if you watched him, he'd go, he was swinging left and going like this through impact. So that, when that goes from there to there, you never know what loft you're going to have. You got no clue as to what you're going to have. And I said, you get, it gets that far forward and his hands that close to the ground, I said, 
and then he's trying to get it in the air this way. He has to, that's the only way he can get it in the air is this way. So he's got to be more behind the ball going like this, which to his credit he did. He, he worked with him really hard on that. And he worked with his other guys on that. He likes that thought. Sean likes that thought of going through the ball like this because he likes swinging left. So um, I think that's, hopefully that, that helps you a little bit. Yes? What are you, crazy? No. No. If it did, this is 32 degrees aloft, I'd have a 32 degree launch angle and a zero attack angle. No. I'll get to that. Absolutely not. Question is, do you want the club to return to the same angle at impact as it is at a draft? From here. All right, I'll get to that though. Club face. All right, so, and I think this is real important too. This is part of being old right here. One of the things that we noticed, you know, back in the day, we were watching guys hit balls. What we saw are guys that had the club face coming in, laying on the plane, all right? In other words, where the face was just laying right on the plane as it came in like this and then would square up at impact like this, they, they would hit their long irons high and their short irons low. Basically, they'd hit every ball the same height. Okay? And guys that had the face coming in more closed from here and then having to lay the face back through impact, hit their short irons high and their long irons low and had a hard time controlling their distance. Okay? And so this is just personal observation. Now, I don't know what the, the science is you know, on it. But, so what I've always liked with the club face because of that, because I think, that's, I think that's real important to be playing from here to there as opposed to playing from here to there, to controlling your trajectory and your distance and so forth. And so what I like to see, first of all, understand the, what the club face really, really is doing. Okay? It's as, this is really important to understand. So imagine a plane, all right? If I kept the club face square to the plane, all the way back and down, it would look like this. So square, 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 square. That would be square. There's the plane. And that club face is square to that plane. Does that look square to you? The baby looks Mega shot. You've never seen one there. But that's square to the plane. Okay? So if I had it like that, I would never need any rotation of the club face to square it up. I could just come right down the plane, keep coming 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 right down the plane. Right down the plane. Right down the plane. Like that, I'll never need anything to close it. All right? So what happens in golf, what we call square, golf terms, is when the club face is 90 degrees open to the plane. Okay, so as it goes back, what I like to see it do is start back square and then at some point rotate 90 degrees open as it goes back so that at the top of the swing it's laying on the plane. Okay, so that's square. That's exactly 90 degrees open to the plane. So now if I bring that back down without any rotation of the club face, the club face would be 90 degrees open. Okay, so I have to close it. Okay, so why that's important is because if you say to yourself, I've got a slicer, this is, this is 90 degrees open, how, how open is that? It's 120 degrees open. It's not just a little open, that's 120 degrees open. I've got to close that to get a square at impact. Okay? You go like that, you go, oh, that's shut. And that's not shut. That's just less open. <laughs> I don't have to close as much to get that back to square. You see what I'm saying? And it's real important to know that because it frees you up as a teacher. You're going, I don't have to say this is the way to, you have to be. You know how this came to be popular? Because we wanted variability. We want to be able to hit high and low and draws and fades all with the same club face position. 
that's what that that's how that came into being as being ideal. It's because it gave you the most variability. Okay? So, like I said, because of being old, okay, get that face 90 degrees open. And as it starts down, I like to see the face lay on the plane like that as it starts down. Hogan did this unbelievably. Mo Norman did this like this. And so if you watch it coming down, you'll see the face just lays at the same angle as the plane down until the left arm gets parallel to the ground. And then once that happens, that club starts to, starts to uncot, believe it or not. You can't keep it from doing it. Once this arm gets below, gets below parallel to the ground, the club starts to uncock. You gotta resist it, you gotta fight it with every fiber of your being, because it's gonna happen. It's just the momentum of the swing. And so, and it starts to, starts close so that when it gets here, it's toe up. This is where you've got that golf pride on there. And then as you rotate like this, the golf pride stays on top, club face is squaring up, squaring up, squaring up. I like to see it stay outside of the hands, obviously, as it goes around like this until it gets toe up over here and then continues to rotate on through after that. But you have to understand, really, you can't leave it like this. But what we found is that if you play this way, you control your distance better than if you play this way. Okay? All right, so this is one of my failures. It's a guy named Scott Weatherly, who's uh, <laughs> guy's got a beautiful golf swing. Uh, he couldn't quite get around the corner soon enough, so he always fought hooking and uh, block, blocking and hooking. But you can see here as he starts back, club face goes back looking at the ball. The reason I like that as a, as a model is that as you go back with the club looking at the ball, it keeps the club in front of your body and even outside your hands. Okay, so I'm like, all right, I don't like... I don't like that. So it's, it's just a way to keep the club on plane, easy way to keep the club on plane by controlling that club face. And then I like to see the right arm fold, or back arm fold, the back wrist cock like that to put the club, rotate the club face 90 degrees open. Then it stays, 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 stays till this arm gets parallel to the ground, then it starts to close and continues to close all the way through impact and after. And so as you can see him, square back and then he rotates it open. You can see there it's laying on the plane. Whoops. This is a little bit past, I couldn't, didn't have any clicks in between. This is a little past parallel to the ground. You can see how the face of the club has started to close slightly. See how it's not exactly laying on the plane there and that's because it's a little bit below uh, down. Here you can see the face of the club is starting to really look at the ball more uh, sooner there. Um, Impact, square, after impact, you can see that the face is not exactly at right angles to that plane. It's starting to close. You know, it's a little bit close to the plane there. Still outside his hands, though. See how it's outside his hands? So it's not like that. It's like, it's like that. And then you can see here it's a little bit more closed. Still laying on the plane, still outside the hands. And then after impact, I mean then after that, when it starts to appear, you'll see the toe of the club up, moving toward laying on the plane farther around. Okay? So that's a pretty good representation of how to control the club face there. I, I, I like that model. Here's a picture of Hogan. This is what the golf digest are. You can see where the club face is, is it's just laying dead on the plane coming into the ball. Here's Tiger when he worked with Hank, and you can see the same thing. I think I actually tell you a story about Tiger. When Tiger worked with Butch, you know, everybody thought that was the best, and he could really hit his ball straight, and he could really hit his ball long, but he couldn't control his distance very well. He was a phenomenal putter, phenomenal short game, he hit a lot of greens, but just his proximity wasn't really all that good. In fact, we played 
I played uh, with him in 1999. Uh, we played in Ireland the week before the British Open at Carnoustie. And the first day we played, we played a scramble. And the, my scramble team was Payne Stewart, Tiger, and the two richest men in Ireland. And then we were playing against uh, Duval, Jansen, Appleby, Mark O'Meara, and a guy named Todd Woodbridge, who was Wimbledon doubles champion. And so we're playing a scramble. And back then, Tiger, that 43-inch driver, hit it really long and really straight. And we used his drive on every hole. But we never used, his, uh, never used one of his approach shots. You know, and so Tiger likes to tease, so he was all over me. He goes, hey, he goes, your divots are deep. I said, yeah, but you keep putting my ball. We're not putting yours. <laughs> so, so he goes, I got to learn how to do that. I got to learn how to hit that shot. He said, uh, you know, because paint, I can both hit the little knockdown wedge in there, you know, and make it spin, and, and Tiger couldn't do that. So I showed him a few things. I'm not taking any credit for it, but I told him, I said, go see Mark O'Meara. Mark's the best in the world at that shot. And so... Uh, the next time I saw Tiger was at Brookline at the Ryder Cup. And he's on the range. And the week before, he had won Firestone, and that's when he had brought out his Stinger. Okay? So he's hitting Stinger drivers, Stinger three woods, Stinger two irons, Stinger wedges. You know, he's just, he won the golf tournament with nothing but knockdown shots. And so I walked up to him on the range. I said, hey, I got a bone to pick with you, man. I said, I said, uh, you, you're all over me about my divots over there in Ireland. You took a half of Ohio with you last week when you won. And he says, oh, the ground was a lot softer. I go, yeah. And he said, let me, he said, let me show you my punchy. He said, I call, he called it his punchy. So he went in there, and I've got film of this, actually. I was filming it while he was telling me. He says, he, so he hits this shot, and he hits this knockdown shot, and he comes through like, comes through like this and finishes he said, what, what do you think? I said, that's pretty good. That's sort of how amateurs do it. That's just sort of how amateurs knock it down. They go down the line like that to hit it low. I said, a pro would keep his arm connected more and go and drag it up the plane instead of dragging it down the line. He said, oh, like this? <laughs> yeah, that's it. Okay, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a guy. I mean, this is what this made him different than anybody else in the world is that this guy, his biggest weakness in July was being able to knock it, knock it down. And he wins a golf tournament in September with that shot, basically using that shot. He just doesn't tolerate weaknesses. Or back then, he didn't, he didn't tolerate any weaknesses. And so when he started working with Hank, you know, Hank had him rotating the face a lot more open than Butch had him. But I mean, Tiger, when he, because of where he was coming from, when he didn't outrun it with his hips, and he squared that club like that, he could control his distance. Awesome. I mean, he flat had control of his, of his ball. I remember watching him at St. Andrews. I forget what year it was, but it must have been 05. Anyway, he's standing there hitting the zeros and on the 100-yard marker and the fives on the 150-yard marker and everything out there at St. Andrews. I mean, he really had control of his, of his ball. It's just a, it was just a little too weak a grip for that hip action. You know, if, if it just strengthened that grip of hair, man, it had it'd been really good, I think. But, but that's when he worked with Hank, and you can see how that face was coming in this way, and he's playing golf like this instead of like, like that. With Butch, he was a little more, a little more that way. And so he could, there was no, it wasn't a lot of face rotation, so he hit it real straight, but he just didn't, couldn't control his distance, couldn't control his trajectory a little bit. Okay, so... Now we've talked about how we want the club to move and how we want the body to move. All right, so we'll talk about all the different parts of the body. We're going to start with the spine as the axis. And so, you know, I've, I've studied with Mac O'Grady a lot. I went down, I've done a lot of clinics uh, with Mac and stuff, and I understand what he teaches. And Mac was sort of the guy that started the uh, uh, single axis motion. I mean, he was basically the guy that invented that. And the way that he came up with it is that he thought you ought to stay centered. What he said was, I think you ought to stay centered. And so he had a, he had a I think it was on the forehead, 
and on the chest and on the belt buckle, he, he would have these dots. And he'd say, I want all of those dots over the ball at all times. Okay? So, he would, so that's where he came up with, with having the head absolutely still and having these three dots. So that's where the center axis swing. When Jim Hardy got involved with it, what happened is that Mike LeBeau had gone and taken a clinic with Mac, and he came back and he talked to Jim about that. And Jim said, yeah, I, I, play, play, I play golf with Jim a lot, so I know what he, he told me about it. He said, they gave me the idea to look at it. He said, because I'd always been teaching John Jacobs stuff. And he said, you know, when I started studying it, I found out how that could fit together and how it's really two different ways to swing. And so that's sort of how all that came about. But I, I've never really understood that because I've always felt like you should move around your spine. Your spine should turn. Your spine should be the axis of your swing. All other sports are that way. You know, there's, uh, you don't do many things like that. And so, why don't you come up? You can be my model real quick. I won't, I won't hurt you. Okay, so just, uh, yeah, can you take your set up, please? Okay, so I'm just going to, put my fingers on his spine, and now just turn back. And the, his spine hadn't moved. So I wouldn't want him pulling away from me. I wouldn't want him moving toward her or pushing against me. I just want his spine to start again. Okay. Okay, go back. All right, good. Okay, so now let's do it again. Okay, now go back. So now the head didn't move, but see how the spine came back this way? And the weight came back this way. All right, thank you. And so, so what I like to see, it, you know, everybody says, oh, well, you don't, why do you want everybody to swing like that? I don't want everybody to swing like that. You know, I want them to swing like that. Well, that doesn't look weird, does it? It's just turn around your spine like that, as opposed to turn around your head like that. And because if my spine's in the back of my body, all my weight's in front of my body in front of my spine, excuse me. And so as I turn around my spine, my weight, it shifts. It's in front of my spine, so it's on this side of my spine, so it's more over my right leg. And as I turn back to the target, my weight's on this side. So all my weight, I transfer my weight going away from an end of the ball. And so I like that. I mean, I, to me, that makes sense to me. And I understand how the other works and if you swing that way your head has to move and the reason is is that your head is bent at the top of your spine you don't want to take your posture and keep your head up and look at the ball out of the bottom of your eyes I learned this from Mac O'Grady okay there's what's called if you look at the ball out of the center of your eyes is what's called a foveal field that's what I, I put up there to remind me to tell you about it and so if you look at, the, at anything out of the middle of your eyes, your hand-eye coordination is enhanced. Okay? If you look at it out of the bottom of your eyes, you lose a lot of your connection to what it is you're trying to do spatially. And so what happens is people that start this way always do this anyway. The head goes down. So if your head is bent on the end of your spine, as you turn, your head's going to move. It's like a coat hanger. It's gonna, the head's going to move. It's going to move back. It's going to move through. It has to because it's bent. It's bent forward. So it has to move. And I see it move about a half a head to the, you know, about a half a head to the right <laughs> and then back to impact. And then it goes, rotates through in front of the ball. Uh, so I'll show you some. So this is Tiger. This is, the, at, this is at Brookline. This is that time I walked up to him. And this is Tiger hitting the six iron. You can see where his head starts up against the ball at the dress, moves back about a half a head to the right. You can see all of his weight's behind the ball. Uh, from here back. And then as he comes back down, his head goes back to where it starts, stays still behind the ball until after impact, and then it finishes in front of the ball. And all of his weight's in front of the ball here, so he's transferring his weight back and through. 
all right? To me, that makes sense. That looks right to me. When I see, when I see the other, it doesn't look right. I don't feel like it, like it, uh, it is as efficient or as powerful. You saw this picture of Duff before. You can see there again, head against the ball as he turns behind it, all his weight's behind the ball. Comes back to impact, his head's back against the ball. And on the follow through, his head's out in front of the ball. Just a transfer of weight back and through with still having the spine as the axis. In other words, it's not like we're moving this way and moving that way. It's moving that way, like that, going back. Any questions on that? Okay. All right, shoulder, how the shoulders move. So this is another, I've looked at this really hard. And I've had a lot of people tell me, well, the shoulders turn at right angles to the spine. Okay, well, let me look at that. I don't know that I believe that. And here's why. Say so this is your spine. And it's gonna be tilted about five degrees to the right, generally. But then the shoulders, are on a 10 degree tilt to your spine. They have to be because your left hand's higher on the grip than your right hand. Or your lead hand's higher on your grip than your trail hand, for those of you who are lefties. Okay? So there's your start. So as I turn, okay, as I go back and turn, it goes back like that. Okay, so I'll start here. So it goes back and turns. So this looks fairly flat. But it's not, it's still at the same relationship to the spine as it was at a dress. It hadn't changed any. Okay? So now as I come back, if I was to square, it would look like that. But as I continue to rotate, see how much lower that looks? So it looks vertical. This looks flat and this looks vertical. But it's just the shoulders maintaining the same relationship to the spine they have at a dress. So I'll show you. And so the backswing shoulder turn is much flatter than the downswing because of that relationship. If it, well, if it wasn't, if I took and I measured from, let's say my belt buckle's pointing at the ball, and I measured the spot between my shoulders, say this far, I measured the spot that far outside the ball, and I turn at that, that shoulder would point at that spot, but it doesn't. It points above that spot on everybody. So what I like to see too, and I talk, I've talked with Art about this, and he was going to mention this, he didn't mention it, but what I like to see is I like to see the back shoulder just move in a straight line back like this as opposed to moving around like that. So I like to see the shoulder just move in a straight line like that on the backswing. So it just makes a B line right over your back heel. And then the downswing, what I like to see from there, is I like to see the shoulder go directly at the ball. So that's got three dimensions, down, out, and forward. So I like to see the shoulder move directly at the ball so that if you drew a line across your shoulders, it would be pointing at the ball. Not at impact, but right after impact and be pointed where the ball was. And then after that, see the shoulder continue rotating through to the target. Okay, so if we, and then the last thing is, is that I think, and this is Jim and I have talked, Jim Hardy and I have talked about this a lot, we both want the club to be deep. In other words, we both want the club to be inside the target line. Now what I like to see is I like to see the shoulder take the club inside. I like for the arms to stay in front of the body and the shoulder to take the club deep. What Jim likes is he likes for the shoulders to stay more tilted and the elbow to take the club deep. But we both get the club where we want it back here. Jim, because the elbow is behind, he likes then on the downswing have the shoulder, have the elbow kick out and go around the body like this and come, up, come behind the body on this side, whereas I like to have the arms always in front of you on both sides. Okay, so it's, it's a difference in style, difference in preference, but we're both trying to get the club to do the same thing when it comes to it. So I'll show you a couple of, 
the example. So this is Tiger in 2002. And so as you look up there, you can see, you can see the plane line and then you can see his posture line. And then at the top of the backswing, that third picture, you can see where his shoulders are pointing. If you do, I drew a line across the top of his shoulders. And then as you watch the downswing, that right shoulder will just go right down that red line into the ball. And so at impact, and just right after impact, because he, he's not real open there at impact. He's open, but not real open. But after impact, you can see how far, how vertical his shoulders are. You can see there's a big difference in where they are there and where they were at the top. This is Hunter Mahan. Same thing. So there's the top of the backswing. There's the downswing. Uh, right at impact, not quite as, as rotate, but you can see he's rotating on the same plane. This is after impact. You can see how his shoulders are much, much more vertical on the downswing than they are on the backswing. All right, hip action. Okay. So I like to see uh, the hips more centered than a lot of guys. And um, I, I feel like that's what the purpose of the hips are. They produce power. You know, they create a lot of power. But I think they, their purpose is to keep you centered with your swing. And so what I like to see is on the back swing, just like the shoulder, I like to see the hip move in a straight line back over the heel like this. So the right cheek goes back and it's like you're loading up on that glute, like you're putting a lot of pressure on that hip, on the backswing like that. And then as you come down, you're, you're, as you're coming down, your weight shifts in the direction your hips are turned. So my hips are turned this way. Now as I, as I start to unwind, my hips are moving in this direction because my hips are facing this. So as they turn, this hip's moving this way, and this hip's moving, moves out. It gets, the knee gets over the foot, but the hip doesn't quite get over the foot because it continues to rotate. So as it comes in, you'll see this hip come back, and this hip go through, and this, leg, this hip won't ever get over this foot until after impact, the left hip. So I don't like that. I don't like where the hip gets over the foot. I like for the hip to rotate inside of that foot. The knee gets over it, but the hip doesn't get over it like that. Then the other thing about the hips, from this view, the hips stay back. So as they go back, this hip goes back. And then as you come down, this hip stays back, and this hip goes back like this. Okay. Now, what happens is your belt buckle goes like this through impact. Okay, but the hips stay back. Now what happens, the reason the belt buckle does this is because you're engaging your core right, at, right before impact. So as you're coming down, it's <clears throat> like that. That's what you see those guys, you see that belt buckle go whoosh, like that. But it's not because they're going like that. It's just because they're, they've got that pelvic tilt and it's just pulling back in like that. Okay, so that's, so I think that's important to see. So we'll take a look at some of these. All right, so this is that Tom Kite picture again. So you can just see with the grid on the background what his hips are doing. So there's a duress, the left picture, and in the back one you can just see that right hip is sort of shifted back almost diagonally a little bit toward the right heel. And then coming down, you know, that hip's not much farther forward than where it started. It's just about, basically about where it started, right there. This is Keegan Bradley. You can see, same thing basically there. Hips are a little farther forward on him. You can see the left hip's a little farther forward, but it's still inside the knee. See how this knee is further forward than the hip? It's never that. 
I see, I talk to Sean about this a lot. I see, I see some of his guys, he gets into that, that hip getting over that foot, and I don't think they can get, they, can get, they get rotated enough. Justin and Tiger, I don't think they get rotated enough at impact. And I think that's why they, they fight the quick hooks and the, and the blocks to the right a little bit. I think they're blocked that way. Um, but I think that's important to see. This is Jamie Sadlowski. So I told Art I was going to show some pictures. So you can see the, the hip action there for sure. You can see again, the hips aren't that much farther forward and they're still way inside the knee. And you see a lot of the power hitters that do that. You know, you see a lot of them are back behind the ball a lot. So you'll see that uh, happen. This is Tiger at Muirfield this year. So you can see at a dress where his hips are, backswing, right hip goes back. And then the downswing over here, you can see at impact, you can see how his hips are back. His hips have not come out underneath him at all. But you can see the difference in the belt buckle. See the difference in his belt buckle line between this picture and that picture? There's a big difference there in his, in his belt buckle. That's just that core engaging, which causes that, that belly button's screaming back to that spine to try and stabilize him for the hit. Any questions on any of this so far? I'm going way too fast. It's all right, I got a bunch of swings I want to show you. Knee action. Okay, so this, is, this was interesting too for me. And I've, I've seen a lot of stuff where the guys say, well, the knee should come go this way. Roll the knee in and roll the knee in like that. Okay? But I don't see that much. The knee is a hinge joint. So this, is, this would be interesting for you biomechanical people. So what happens is it works this way. This is the way the knee works. And it's going to point halfway between where the foot is pointed and where the hip is turned. Just going to point halfway between them. So my foot's pointed that way, my hip turns here like this, my knee's going to point there. Well, it, like Jamie said, Lowski, his hips are turned that much, his knee's pointed there. Okay, Tom Kite doesn't turn his hips much, his knee's pointed there. Okay, and then as it, when it comes back, the impact, what happens is this knee works backwards. This works like a hinge. What happens if you're, you're running back and your knee does that? What happens to your knee? Or if your knee does that, what happens to your knee? It's not good. It's bad on your knee. That's how you tear stuff, making your knee do that. It doesn't like doing that. So the same thing coming through. So... This knee points halfway between this foot and this hip. So at whatever point in the swing, once that knee's bending, it's pointed in that direction. All the way around to here, it's pointed in that direction. Over here, it's pointed in that direction. Now this is off the ground, so this foot and this hip are pointing the same direction. Like that. Okay, so the knowing how how they move, don't try and force, don't try and force that, just get some turn. I haven't seen anybody turn like this and go like that. <laughs> I have seen some people turn and go like that. What happens when they do that? That's no good. So it just goes, all right. Uh, good image to have and how that, the sequence of it is like you got a, got a pig between your legs. As you go back, you squeeze that pig. Then on, as you start down, you let it go. And then you catch his tail in the end. So I'll show you some guys who do that. So there's Jamie. He's got the pig between his legs. He's squeezing it right there. He's letting that guy go right there. And then he's, I haven't quite gone far enough through, but he's catching the tail over there on that side. And again, that's what you see. Long hitters all have that big separation in the legs. 
It's because they're not going this way. They're not sliding forward. They're rotating. So they're, all of their weight's being shoved down into the ground on both feet. I mean, all, you can't imagine how much pressure they're putting down in there. And then they're, as they're coming down, they're pushing up with their feet, and this shoulder just keeps going down into the ground. You've got to reach the ball with something, right? So you can't, you can't, you can't go like that and reach the ball. So as, so as when you start down, their bow leg looks what you want. You're getting all that pressure into the ground, and you're pushing, 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 pushing. And the shoulder just keeps reaching, 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 reaching like that. It's a real interesting uh, dynamic, I think. So here's Tom Kite with his knee action. You can see because he doesn't turn his hips back very far, his knee doesn't ever point back behind the ball. And then he gets some separation over there. He doesn't have much because he doesn't have, his knee didn't go very far, but he still has some. And then you can see him catching the, catching the tail as it goes through right there. All right, moving on down. Let's see here. Foot action. I like, I like both feet flat on the ground. I like them flat on top of the backswing. I like them flat starting down. I like them flat at impact with an iron. With a the driver, they're going to be a little bit off the ground because the ball is farther forward. Stance tends to be a little wider. But I like both feet flat on the ground for that very reason we're talking about. They're just shoving into that ground as they come down like that. And what I see is that if you're, if you have lag, you don't want to outrun it. In other words, that was one of the th issues I had with some of the stack and tilt stuff is that if I got in front of the ball, then I couldn't lag the club. If I lagged the club, I'd be too steep. And so it was good for people that did that, and they like to have a lot of right arm throw. They don't like wrist, wrist throw. They like right arm throw to match up with the fact that they're left. But to me, I always like people behind the ball rotating so that they can lag the club, can t keep that chain of chain reaction moving as long as they possibly could to create as much possible speed as, as they could. Um, so on all the foot plate stuff that we see, what we see is that when the shoulder goes back, the weight moves to the back heel, okay, on the back swing. So you'll see on all these foot pressure things, you go heel, and then as the weight goes forward, just because your hips are still closed, move, they're unwinding, but they're more closed, so they move, your weight moves out toward the left ball of your foot, left metatarsal, and that is the major decelerator in your swing. That's the ground up. That's moving from the ground up. So what happens is that when you go out, you get that left ball of the foot uh, as soon as you hit that spot, then everything starts rotating. You don't want to go past that. So you don't want to go, you don't want that ankle to roll over. You don't want that foot to be like that at impact. Because you lose your deceleration, so you lose the transfer of energy that you get from the ground up. And so you go past your turning point. I'll fight Luke Donald is, I mean, he's got, he's, he gets, Slide and slide and slide and gets outside that foot and he comes in, his shoulders are closed and whew, flips his wrist over at the ball like that. Okay, so, you know, he misses that and that's why he's short and crooked. He loses his deceleration, he, misses, he runs past his turn point, and so then he has to flip it with his hand so the face of the club is rotating through impact so fast that he's has, got to have immaculate timing to hit straight shots. Okay, so we worked, that's one of the things we worked on last time was, before we went to Japan, was trying to get that, use that as his, as his turn point. So as soon as you hit that ball of that foot, let your, let your hips do, start getting back out of the way. Don't keep, don't keep going past that ball and then trying to catch up later on. That's a big, that's, that is the major decelerator for speed. I mean, that's, the, it's real important for you to understand that because people say, oh, yeah, well, you see these guys, they finish, they're like this. I'm going to show you a swing in a minute. This guy comes in and the longest hitter I ever saw comes in and 
He's a big old guy, and he comes down. That foot is wham, it's flat like that, and then he's got so much speed, their impact after he hits it, then his foot just, like Jamie said, Lowski's foot goes. He does a moonwalk back when he hits it like that, because he, he's putting the brakes on. It's what they call shear force pattern of ground reaction forces. And so what that means is, have any of you seen these fitter first spinners that you stand on? They're wooden. They're uh, two sheets of wood with, uh, with uh, in the middle where the top one spins over the, the bottom one. You know, it's for fitness guys, we use them a lot. And so wherever your feet go, these things will spin. And so the long hitters, you put them on those fitter first, on the backswing, their feet go like this. Their feet twist that direction. And on the downswing, their feet go like this. Short hitters, they go backswing, they go like this. The downswing, they go like this. It's that deceleration resistance. That's how they decelerate the backswing. That's how they decelerate the downswing. And so, you don't, obviously, their feet aren't moving around and gone. But if you look at guys like Greg Norman, what did that foot do? It went back behind him like this. It came through. It's that shear force pattern to create deceleration from the ground. And that left ball of that foot is a big, big guy right there for speed. If you want to hit it long, you need to be familiar with that guy. All right, so here's the duff, flat-footed at the top, at impact, after. Here's Tiger 2002, flat-footed at the top, flat-footed at impact, and then up after that. And then here's my guy right here. This is my long guy. I got to show you this guy. I want to put that, bring that swing up. That's okay. No, we just, I go to this. Okay, I'm going to talk from back here. We're going to run tiny through slow, a little bit at a time first. That is his name. Okay, so you can see. You can see he's squeezing that pig. And then he's going to let it go. He's let it go, and now he's going to start. Yeah, look where that left foot is. See how much his toes turned in there? I mean, that, that foot is putting the brakes on right there for that club to go whipping by. Now watch his foot after that. Okay, I want to show you. Now, this guy, the reason we knew he was long, I'm going to play that again. The reason we knew he was long the way I teach is that we start at impact. So we start with a little chip shot and say, okay, get everybody to get that feeling, you know, like Art was talking about those little deals. You know, then we go to punches. So we get an eight iron, go halfway back and try to hit a punch shot. The tiny is out there, he's from Louisiana. He comes out there, he's doing that. So he's hitting these eight irons. We can't believe how far they're going. I said, put him on a launch mower. Let's see how far this is going. This is back in the 90s sometime. Hitting his eight iron, 240. Punch shot, punch shot, okay? So he's hitting this eight iron, 240. I said, oh my God. And this is he's hitting the driver here. We never could get a reading on his driver because it was so, the shaft was so soft. And we put him in the stiffest shaft we had, with no help at all. And I mean, he'd hit these, whoosh, whoosh. I mean, these balls wouldn't even get in the air with this driver. We had to get him, had to get him fit. But I'm gonna show you what that looks like in real speed now. And let's see. Let's 
<laughs> How's that for speed? Watch his head. Watch his head when he comes down. <laughs> Tiny can make that baby go now, I gotta tell you. Uh, let's see. Okay. But you can really see that in action. You see how his foot's actually pointed back this way. So he comes out of his foot, then he comes down, he plants it this way so that it won't it, it, it can't keep going. So it can't go. So he puts on the brakes with that baby like that, everything goes Whew! And then he's got so much speed that he you know, it just pulls him around like that. He was a he was a heck of a guy. That guy. I mean, he was. Uh, he didn't know anything. <laughs> I mean, he just hit it a long way. Now I got to tell you, I don't even. That was the only time I ever saw. I never saw him again after that. He was from Louisiana. Came to the golf school we were doing, and uh, two hundred and forty yard eight iron. Uh, had divots about that deep. <laughs> he did not mind. Mashing on that ball. All right, arm motion. Okay, so this is what I like with arms. I like for the arms to stay in front of the body throughout the swing. So what I like is the arms always in front. Never, I don't like them ever getting behind like that. And I like them pretty connected too. Um, and I think this is important to know too for consistency sake. So as I go back, as this back arm, as I go back, the back arm folds or bends in. Now when I bend this back arm, like this is a triangle, when I shorten this one leg of triangle, watch what happens to my wrist watch. See how it turns? And to me, that's what opens the club face, is that folding of that arm. And that gives me the right amount of rotation of that club face right there. Okay, so I don't like independent twisting of the arms to create the rotation. So if I just fold this arm in, then it rotates, okay? And what's interesting too, and this is what I see a lot with good go, this is the same thing that Art was talking about. As I fold the lead arm, what happens to the club face? It rotates. So it rotates the right amount. This is straight, and see how my wrist watch is turned over? Okay, so if I can control the club face with the bending of the arms, then I don't have to flip my wrist. And so what you'll see, you'll see, you'll see guys when they're playing their best, when, when you see them come out over here, you'll see this arm underneath the shaft like this, and you'll, a lot of, and you'll see this wrist will have very little bend in it. It has some because it goes, it's going through that far, but it won't have much. Some guys have none. Guys that don't do that, that don't fold their arm, that don't keep this arm connected on the follow-through, when they come through, their wrist is collapsed like this. So you'll see this picture. You'll see this here, this, uh, this forearm pointing in this direction, and this wrist in that direction. So you'll see that look. I mean, we're good players too, I'm talking about. As compared to, you go square the club with the, with the elbow, then you don't have to do it with the wrist. So I think that's real important. I think the other function of the arms is as they go, is as the shoulder pulls the club inside, the arms bring the club up. So the arms are responsible for the height of the backswing. Okay? So, Yes. And you can have, yeah, I learned this from Mac O'Grady too. Do you have any balls in here, Ryan? No. Okay, I'm in the wrong pocket. That's an address for a gay bar. I don't know what that's doing. In. <laughs> this, these okay for a moment? So I, li I always liked it. I use this a lot. So Mac was I'm talking with Mac about how much lift in the arms. 
And he said, you know, basically what you've got is you've got three pressure points in this upper arm to the body. You've got one way up underneath your arm, then one about halfway down, then one down near the bottom. And what he likes to see, okay, I don't know if I can do this, okay. What he likes to see is that as you start back, you keep all three together. And then when your lead arm gets parallel to the ground, you lose one. And when you get to the top of the swing, you lose two. But you can see that arm is still pretty connected. Okay, so I, I th I've always thought that was a great way of, of bringing that out. And then as you start down, you reconnect all three. And what creates that reconnection, okay, this is, you know, a lot of people think, okay, bring that elbow in the side. Well, what creates that, that reconnection is the fact that the body is rotating into the arm. The arm's actually still going back as the body starts to go forward, and that's what reconnects the arm, is that sequence. Okay, most people think, well, yeah, keep your shoulders turned, bring your elbow into your side. You don't want that. You lose ground up. You lose the chain of sequence of events. So as you get up here, that's what my body's turning into that elbow, not vice versa. Okay? Yeah, I really wasn't in that address for a gay bar in there. I don't, I don't want anybody to... Well, there's nothing wrong with that, Brian, if that's your choice, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's up to you. I mean, I'm not... <laughs> I'm not one to judge or anything like that, you know. Okay, so let's see a couple of good examples of, of good arm movement. All right, here's the duster. This is fourth hole at Augusta. Uh, he's playing the front of the back tee, so he's probably four iron, something like that. So you can see where his elbow is related to his body. See how, how much in front of his body it is? And then coming down, you can see how his arm is in front of his body. After impact, see how his left arm is in front of his body. Okay, so I think you're, I see that in good ball strikers. It's a timing issue, okay? How do you know if your arms are with your body or not? Well, either they're in front of them or they aren't, you know? So I, what I see is good ball strikers, they look like this, and guys that struggle look like this a little bit, except for Fury. Fury doesn't. But I mean, there's just that much difference between there and there. You know, it's just your arms are behind. You know, you got to catch up somehow. So you have to stop the chain and, and do something active to get the club back to the ball. So I really like that picture. I mean, I, that's a, a picture I try to get everybody to, to do. Here's Dustin Johnson. So you can see him coming down. You can see how much his elbow's in front. You can see uh, on that picture the, in the blue, you can see how much the elbow's in front. And then after impact, you can see where the left elbow is. You can see how it's connected and in front of his body. And his left arm, if anything, it's not even vertical. It's actually over this way some, you know, which is better. I mean, that's even better. Here's Hogan. You can see this is Hogan top of his backswing. I asked Jim Hardy, I said, is that a, that's not a one plane or a two plane. What is that? That's about a half plane. His arms are under his shoulders, his left arm. Uh, and then at, the, at impact, that white thing here, this is his forearm. And here's his sweater on the back. So you can see that's in front of his hip. And then at the top, on the follow-through, you can see how connected his left arm is there. He had a high follow-through because the, what happened is he, he maintained, sustained his lag so long as he went around the corner like that that eventually the club caught up. And when it caught up, it just pulled his arms out of the socket. So he was, he was way around, connected, 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 connected. And then that arm would just blast off over here because he... He couldn't hold the club back. The club was moving so fast, going around that corner. He's a, he, he came off his skis, that water skier, as he went whew, 
down there with that. Here are some other pictures of coming in. So Keegan, he's, you know, always top three in total driving. Dustin Johnson's always right up there in total driving. Annika in her heyday. Uh, this is Tiger. And, you know, he's, a, he's always been good at having his arms in front of his body. Uh, now, to me, I think his weight's too far left there, and his body, upper body's not rotated enough there. But, you know, again, just looking at the position of the arms related to the body, they're in front of the body. And I really think that's a big, important, important part to good ball striking. So here's some others. The guy in the top left, number one ball striker on tour last year, Graham Dillette. And you can see where his club's coming out underneath his shoulders, left arm is glued to his side. Dustin Johnson, you saw that picture. Here's Hunter Mahan. He's top five in ball striking. There's Tom Kite, 92, probably the best ball striker on tour at the time. I mean, that's, that's just what they do. They keep the club on plane after impact. And so the club's moving in that direction through impact. That's why you can have lag. Okay, so launch monitor guys, the more lag, the more down your club's moving, the more out it's moving. The more lag you have, the more left you have to go. Because otherwise, if you don't, if you go down the line with lag, then your club's going to go big time in to out. That's why you have to, if you have lag, you have to go left. If you have a lot of downward angle, you have to have leftward angle. If you have upward angle, you got to have rightward angle. All right. All right, hand and wrist motion. Okay, so the hands start with the lead wrist bent and the right wrist flat and as you go back the right wrist bends backwards making the left wrist flat okay so the wrist is going like that all right now it has some of this but it doesn't have a whole heck of a lot believe it or not you think there's a lot of you think there's a lot of wrist cock is this way there's not a lot it just doesn't move as much that way as it does this way Okay, so this wrist bending backwards flattens out the lead wrist. Okay, so when you get to the top, that's the picture that Art wanted you to have. This right here. What did he say? I want their arms in front of you, away from you. I want this holding this thing up like this, right? Okay, so and so what happens is then the wrists just stay in that attitude the rest of the swing if they can. So as they're coming down, as the body's rotating into the ball, this elbow's in front. As it continues to rotate, this handle's coming in, the wrists are maintaining that angle. And then they go on around like this. Now, what happens is, people are saying, what about a release? Okay, so what defines a release? So a release is one of two things. It's either a, an uncocking, okay, or a club face rotation, right, wouldn't you say? Has anybody got a different definition of release? Be one of those two things for most people. So for club face rotation, I like it more with the body rotation and the folding of the lead arm to get the club face to rotate as opposed to flipping the wrist, okay? And then the wrist uncocking is not, not much, okay? So if I... If I'm coming in like this, and you'd say, okay, he's got 90 degrees of wrist cock, okay? All right, so I'll bring it around over here. This is the, this is how much wrist cock I, this is how much release I have. From here to there. That's not much. And the weight of the club will do that for me. I don't have to do it. I don't have to uncock my wrist. They uncock like that. Okay, and so most of the time what you see with tournament players is their wrist will uncock to where the thumb is level with the arm, okay, and that'll sole the club on the ground. 
the Arc Salingers and those guys, their wrists get like this, a lot of them. They have so much of this, their wrist will actually get this way. The thumb will actually be like that. But they're crooked as they can be. You know, but that's more, just more speed, more uncocking. And so working with guys to be good tournament players, you want to get the club sold. You want that much as opposed to, as opposed to more. So that's, that's about all of the, that's about all there is to that risk, risk uncocking. You know, you think, it, well, that's, that's 90 and say that looks like zero. You uncock your wrist 90 degrees, but it's two different angles. So this is 90. That's, you uncock about 30 degrees probably. Something like that. Okay? Now, I thought Chris Cuomo might be there, so I put a couple words in there. He'd, he'd understand. Flexion extension, radial ulna deviation. Okay, so here's a good example of what that looks like. Here's Luke. It's really interesting. We put Luke on 3D stuff, and just for basic speeds, his hips are slower than tour average, his shoulders are slower than tour average, and his wrists are mega fast. I mean, his wrists are flying. They're like 2,100 RPM in there. Tour average is about 18. But his hips are 3, 330, something like that. And his shoulders are right at 600 RPMs. Man, those hands are flying. But you can see again, you can see where his wrist is at impact. It's flat there, it's flat there. As he comes out, you can see he's connected. And you can see how his wrist is not almost flat there, pretty close, because he's done more of this, this folding and stuff with that. A um, couple of other pictures. So this is Tiger out of dress. Left wrist bent, impact, left wrist flat. So this is left wrist flat. And then the left arm's down, it's pretty vertical. The left wrist got a little give, but not much. Again, just showing how the wrist move, move in the swing. And then this is Justin Rose. You can see there's his hands at address, and there's his hands at impact. That's how much uncocking there is. Okay? Shaft's drooping. The wrists are uncocking. You can see that his arm and the shaft there are not the same as his arm and the shaft there. That's just that uncocking that he gets there. Does that answer your question? Okay, so I, 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 I see that mostly. Now, I must say I see a lot of guys, guys with a lot of lag, okay, a lot of times their hands will be below that line. And the reason is is that if, if you've got more lean in the shaft, you've got a broken radius into the ball. And so it's a shorter distance, so you have, to, you have to reach a little lower. And that's what you'll see. So you'll see some guys come out that are lower uh, than that, but because the shaft's leaning forward and the club face is square, it's really like that. It gets the toe down, gets the club sold as well. And I don't know if that's made sense. So let's say if I, so I've got, I'm here. Now that toe is off the ground until I square it up. Now you see how the toe's on the ground again. Okay, so you'll see some guys like Sergio come out with his hands pretty low. I've got most of my guys, I, I over teach lag sometimes. Uh, I'll get my guys' hands a little bit too far forward trying to keep, get, get the compression on the ball, and their hands will be a little bit below that line. A lot, of, a lot of my students will do it. Duff does that, and some other guys will do that a little bit with that. Okay, so. That's enough theory. I'm going to give you a couple of, couple of ways that I teach this, okay? And I think it's pretty, you know, I've had a lot of success doing this. Um, like we do golf schools, this is the way we try and teach this. So what I'll do is we'll start at impact. Always start at impact, okay? And so we'll explain what impact is. 
Okay, you want your hands this flat and this bent, hands up by the front leg, uh, talking about where that is. And so we'll start off, start the students off. We'll say that in order to uh, hit the ball straight, when you're in that position, you've got to have the right grip. So then that's where we explain having the thumb a little bit to the side of the grip, getting the heel pad on top and so forth. Um, we, we'll talk about the grip. And so then we'll say start here. And then what I want you to do is I want you to keep the club face looking at the ball and go about waist high. And the reason I want it looking at the ball is I don't want them to have to flip the club when they come back down. And then I want you to try to com compress the ball against the ground, pinch the ball against the ground, take a little divot, and then come through with this arm connected and the wrist in the same position. So we'll have them hit shots like that and then coach them until they can do it. Okay, so it's, it's, it's similar to what what Art was, was talking about, uh, you know, trying to get guys to compress the ball first. That's important. And then the second thing we'll do, we'll say, okay, that's the impact position we want for all shots. We'll say, okay, here's, here's uh, the second step. Okay, so we're going to take an eight iron. Then we do that with a pitching wedge. So then we take an eight iron. We start with the hands in the address position. And we say, okay, we just want you to start the club back, looking at the ball, just until your hands get even with your foot. And then we want you to load up your arms and wrist. So we'll say, as you go from here, we want your back elbow to fold into your body. And we want your back wrist to fold backwards, like this. So we'll go elbow into the wrist, back wrist backwards. And so we want all of that occurring by the time that your arm gets parallel to the ground. And so when you're in that position, we want three things. We want this elbow connected to the body. We want this wrist flat. We want the shaft to point at the target line. So we want it on plane. So we'll say we want you there, and then we want you to feel like you rotate your hips as aggressively as you can and hit a punch shot. So we'll have them hit shots where they go back to there, and then they rotate and try to hit punch shots. So we're trying to maintain the impact, but now we're adding some load and adding some speed of rotation through impact. And then the last thing is, we'll, then we'll take a like six iron, and we'll say, okay, from here to here. Now, you've described your plane, okay? So what we basically want you to do is find a way to keep the club moving up that plane, okay? And so what we want you to do is use your back shoulder to finish the backswing by pulling that club up that plane like that. So the feeling that we want you to have, square, arms and wrist, shoulder. Now your weight's on the heel. Then we want your back shoulder to bring the club, to bring the club down to impact. So we want the right shoulder to go down, out, and forward, getting the hands up to that position. So the shoulder's moving over the heel, moving down into the ball, and then as you continue going through, we want the shoulder to continue going through all the way through to the target. And so we've shown them how each part of the body moves, and then we'll show them, we'll want them to use other clubs, so we'll talk about the difference in ball position between woods and irons, and say, once you do the same thing, make the shoulder go to the heel, shoulder to the ball, shoulder to the target, all the way through with that. And say, so just move the ball forward when you get to the woods, but do the same thing. You still want to hit down on a fairway wood or a hybrid. It just won't be as big a divot, but you want a divot. Yes? What are you saying starts the down swing? Are you saying take your right shoulder? We use it, I use it as a, uh, it's not what actually happens, but I use it as a cue. It seems to make everything else do the right thing. Um, so the feeling that they have as they come down is they're trying to get this shoulder as close to the ball as they can. So when they do, their weight automatically shifts to the front foot, their hips open up, and they stay down on the ball. So they end up getting it like that if they move the shoulder in the right plane. Now, you, can, you know, the only time you, you know, the shoulder messes up is if it goes in the wrong plane. And so if the shoulder goes overplane, that's no good. If the shoulder goes down but not out and forward, that's no good. 
in your same way. If the shoulder goes down and out but not forward, that's no good. So you want the shoulder to go all three dimensions at once. Well, if it goes down, it goes under your chin. You see what I'm saying? That's why I'm saying control in the plane of the shoulder turn through impact is huge. Well, and I want that. But what, what you think and what happens are two different things. Okay, in other words, I want you to feel like, okay, I want that shoulder to go at the ball. Okay, so when it does, all of this stuff happens. It's called uh, it's what's called a chunker cue, which means that you think of one thing and it takes care of four or five things with one thought, which to me that's good teaching. And so I found that if they if they move this shoulder on the right plane, boy, that your weight goes to your left foot, your hips clear, you stay down on the ball, all that stuff happens. That what messes up shoulder moves in the wrong plane, so it moves too high, that moves your head forward. That's what guys don't like. Jim Flick, he hated shoulder thoughts of any type ever, didn't he, Mark? And he just didn't want shoulders. He just didn't he'd ignore them. I said, well, train them to do the right thing. Don't, don't ignore them if they're doing the wrong thing. Make them do the right thing. You know, like, like that. The other part of that, I mean, this is, again, is part about having a, a method. You only want that if your arms are in front of you. Because your shoulder, as it's moving to the ball, gets the hands there first. The hands will be, the hands are in front of the shoulder. So now you've already hit the ball by the time the shoulder gets to the ball. If the hands are in front of your body. If they're behind, that won't necessarily be the, be the case, but if they're in front. I like the analogy of having the golf flag lettering on top of the grip and moving through it. Yeah, keep it there. I, I think I've, I've found that's really helped people understand how to close the club without laying it back. You know, keep the compression on the ball and keep the ball on the club and so forth. I'm, I'm glad that, that you like that because I, I, I like that a lot. So that's a, I'll, I'll do that a lot with beginning students that I have. You know, I'll explain the whole thing, say, okay, next time I see you, I just want you to be sure you hit a bunch of punch shots between now and then, so on and so forth. You know, move it. But now we've got a, a framework from which we can all work. Same thing with golf schools. If I do that, then the rest of the golf school, I'm coaching that. Of the teaching's over, and I'm just coaching that. You know, make, just trying to make them do it. Um, and then the, the, the other way I do that, I was telling somebody at lunch, uh, yeah, I was tell, <laughs> telling him at lunch, I was talking, he asked me how things are going working with Keegan Bradley. And I said, well, you know, I tried to talk him out of, out of taking lessons. I said, I don't want to teach you. And he said, why? And I said, you've been out there three years. You've won three tournaments. One of them's a major. And I said, all your statistics are good. I said, you don't need to, you don't need to take lessons from me. Please. You got, you're working with Jimmy McLean. Got a great teacher. He said, Jimmy hadn't given me anything to work on in two and a half years. I said, he's right. <laughs> <laughs> don't, just keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> he's, Jimmy's got it figured out. And... Uh, you know, no, I want to get better. I got to get better. Just that and the other. You know, I'm looking. I'm going. He said, I'm going to come down and see you. I said, all right. I said, I'll be your consultant. That's what I'll be your consultant. So, so he comes down. And I'm thinking, how can I avoid working on his full swing? And I looked at his stats. And the short game stuff wasn't all that hot. And he was basically dead last on tour in proximity to the hole for greens hit and regulation. So he hit a lot of greens, but he just never hit the ball very close. And because he hit it so high, he just couldn't control his short irons because that's where those are the clubs that you hit close to the hole. So he hit, he hit the green with the short iron, but he just never hit it close. So I said, okay. So he came down. He, he flew in on Friday night. We're going to work on Saturday, and he's going to fly out Saturday night. And I said, okay, so we're going to do some – we're going to start in the short game. And so – I said, okay, for a chip shot, a chip and run, where you want a low shot, it's going to have a little check and then release like a putt. I said, I want you to just put your hands forward. And as you go back, I want you to keep the club face looking at the ball so that when you come down, you don't have to do anything with the club face. It's already square. Just pinch the ball against the ground. And as you come through, just let your hands 
go around your body like that, keeping that wrist flat. So you're just going to go back like that, a little chip shot. Okay, so we worked on that a while. So then I said, okay, so now for a pitch shot, where you're going to fly it further than you roll it, I said, I said, what I want you to do is you go through chip, and then I want you to get the, fold your back arm, let the toe of the club open up like this. Okay, so once, it, once you get there, then I want you to go around the corner same way. That's where we're talking about keeping the golf right on top. So from a pitch shot like this, and the reason I do that, a chip shot, you want to hit it low, so you keep it hooded the whole time, right? For a pitch shot, you want the toe of the club up because that puts the loft on the club. And again, I don't have to do anything to add loft. So if I'm shut and I'm coming in, I want to hit a high shot, I've got to, I've got to do that. So that doesn't work. So anyway, so toe up, go around the corner. So we work on pitch shots for a while. I said, all right, bunker. Okay, so go from chip go to pitch, and I said, now bunker, you need to have more speed. So I want you to cock your wrist, but I want you to be on plane. So this is pointed at the target line. So you're going to be here on the bunker shot, and then you're just going to go around the corner the same way. You're going to start with the face open. Just going to go, whoosh, go around the corner exactly the same way. So I, five hours I work on short game. I go, oh, man, I'm going to get out of this without doing anything with this full swing. It's going to be perfect. So we got about an hour left, and he goes, what about full swing? <laughs> I go, you don't want to change your full swing. Keep your full swing. Don't. Let's just get this down first. Let's get this down. We'll get the short game down, the distance wedges down. Uh, then we'll, we'll work on that, because his distance wedge, he was, he was playing this way. You know, it's like, I remember I was telling you, it's hard to control your distance going this way. You want to be more like, more like this instead of like that through impact. So we'd worked on that. He said, no, 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 I want, I, want, I, want to, I want you to look at my full swing. He said, all right, but how, how, does that, how does that work? I said, all right. So <laughs> chipping, pitching, <laughs> bunker. And I said, okay, here's your plane. And I said, you want to stay on that plane? So I said, just use your, and he goes like, you know, he, he's pretty good really right about here. And then he goes like that. So he's, he's all about, about like that. And it's mostly just with his shoulder. He's actually pretty connected there. He's about like that. And then he goes, I mean, it's good. He put his laser right on the ball every time. So chipping, pitching, bunker. And this, there, I never showed him a swing on video. I didn't take out any launch monitor or anything like that. I just, so he said, I said, just follow that plane. Just reach for that. They're outside. There's a fence behind us. Just reach for that fence with your right shoulder over there. So, so he goes. So he moves it from here to here, okay? And he moves about that far. And he just draw, hits his draw. He goes, ah, a draw. I haven't hit a draw in two, two years. God, that's so good. Let me do it again. Same thing. Reach for that fence. Wow, oh, look at that draw. Man, I haven't hit a draw like that in two and a half years. That's unbelievable. So. He said, but that's really super flat, isn't it? <laughs> I said, yeah, that's pretty super flat, all right. <laughs> you know, from here to here, you know. <laughs> Moved it. I mean, maybe that much. But it just goes to show you, you know, because he's, he's dropping it so much that he dropped it a little under plane to help him hit a draw. And so then he goes to Malaysia and he lights it up. First, first round, seven under. Second round, six under. He's got a four-shot lead. He calls me up. I've never had control of the ball like this in my life. I'm 100% up and down. He says, I, this is the way I want to swing for the rest of my life. I hit it like Duffner today. <laughs> and I go, oh, boy, this is not going to end well. Because <laughs> his expectations are off the charts. I mean, they are off the charts. So I'm going, oh, my God. And uh, Hawthorne effect, which Cameron was talking about earlier today, is really uh, what, if you think something is right, even if it's wrong, it'll work for a while. In fact, most of our students go from Hawthorne to Hawthorne to Hawthorne. You know, they find something that works for the minute, and they think that's it until it doesn't. And so he really hadn't made much, much change, but he thought he had. And so it worked with him for a while. So... Those are sort of the two ways I go through 
I go, I go through that. One, with the, one was with a tour player and the other one was not. So I think we're ready for questions. Got time for one. Okay. So, talking about footwork. Yeah. Well, what, if it's coming up in any direction, okay, it's thrusting in whatever direction it's coming up. So obviously, you're a good player. You're not, it's not going that direction. So it's going this direction, which throws you past the ball. And so once you get past the ball, then you have to, it's like, in effect, moving the ball back in your stance as you swing. And so as I go in front of the ball, it's just like, I said, moving the ball back. So when the ball's back, your, your pass going to be too much from the inside. You're going to hit blocks and hooks. And so what you want to do is you want to feel like that you have more rotation to bring the club in line with the ball this way as opposed to being out here where you have to bring the club in line with the ball that way. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. <laughs>